Live from KSAT 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. Okay, and you said he was really drunk? Yes. Like, I could smell it in his breath. Slurring his words and telling a teen girl that he loved her, all with a blood alcohol content estimated to be several times the legal limit. Newly released documents and recordings of witness interviews lay out the most complete picture yet of the night that Councilman Clayton Perry was involved in a drunken hit and run crash last fall. Garrett Berger gives us the moments right before Perry's Jeep slammed head on into another car. Do you know what we're speaking about? It's about that, uh, that really drunk guy. Two days after Clayton Perry came through this Bill Miller drive through ahead of a hit and run crash on November 6th, the 17 year old cashier remembered the 67 year old councilman well while talking with a San Antonio police detective. Like his window was all the way down. Both of his arms were out the window. And all of a sudden, he just kept on saying, I love you. I'm here just to see you. The teen says Perry's eyes were halfway open, and she could smell the booze on his breath. Despite not having ordered food, she and her manager say Perry tried to take the order for the car behind him. Whenever I asked him like for his payment method, he was like giving me his keys. He was like showing me his ID and like trying to give me his wallet. Just before his trip to Bill Miller, police say Perry was at a bar across the street where by SAPD's count, security cameras show him downing more than 14 drinks over about four hours. A mixture of beers, shots, and mixed drinks. The detective calculated Perry's blood alcohol content to be over three times the legal limit. Perry's attorney said in court the councilman actually had about half what police claim, and he contended Perry's behavior on police body camera from after the crash could be explained by having suffered a concussion. There's a lot of acorns living here. The prosecutors contend his earlier actions showed Perry should not have been behind the wheel, a view shared by the Bill Miller barbecue manager, who called 911 as Perry left. It wasn't safe for him to be driving, and I was really concerned about if he would get into an accident, him getting hurt or him hurting another person. Perry ultimately pleaded no contest last month to misdemeanor charges for failure to stop and give information and DWI. A judge gave Perry a type of probation that allows him to avoid a conviction. Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. A family who was crushed and injured by a fallen tree at the San Antonio Zoo now filing a lawsuit against the zoo and people it hired to care for the trees there. The lawsuit claims that the zoo and Alamo City Arbor Care should have known the tree was unhealthy when it crashed last March. The two parents involved, Crystal and Liberato Rodriguez, and their two minor children caught under that tree while visiting the zoo last spring break. The family was visiting from Temple. The lawsuit claims the tree showed signs of rotting before it fell. The suit asked for past and future medical expenses and an award for their pain and suffering, mental anguish, loss of earnings, as well as punitive damages. Tonight, San Antonio police are investigating a crash that sent three people to a hospital. This crash happened around 1130 last night on Loop 1604 near Hebner Road on the city's north side. Investigators say there was a two car crash on Loop 1604 when a third car then slammed into the back of them. Three people were taken to a nearby hospital, one of them in critical condition. Police say the drivers of the third vehicle, the driver of the third vehicle was arrested on suspicion of DWI. The name of that driver has not been released. San Antonio police say they are looking for this man. SAPD says Samuel Crawford is wanted in connection to a robbery that happened April 10th at a food mart on Ruiz Street. Police say there's an active warrant out for his arrest. According to officers, Crawford pulled out a handgun during that robbery. Nobody was hurt. Anyone with information can call SAPD at 210-207-0300. A man accused of a deadly shooting in 2021 at a Northwest Side motel now having his day in court. Douglas Skaggs on trial for murder. Opening statements got underway this morning. Erica Hernandez takes us inside the courtroom as the state laid out its case during opening arguments. Dispute about a vehicle is what prosecutors say led to the death of Tito Roman and the arrest of Douglas Skaggs. All of this evidence is going to tell a story. That story is going to unfold over the next few days. And the story that it will tell um, is about a dispute between Douglas Skaggs and Tito Roman. 
over some stolen property. On March 17, 2021, Roman was found with several gunshot wounds at the Home Suites Motel in the 4900 block of Northwest Loop 410. Prosecutor Casey Sandoval during opening statement says that text messages from Skaggs to Roman would reveal Skaggs was getting upset and threatening him over a Ford Bronco he believed was his. Evidence would then show that Skaggs and his girlfriend Haley Gibbons planned to meet up with Roman. This plan involved getting Haley, who also knew Tito, to pretend that her and Doug were on the outs, that they were having an argument, and to lure Tito to a hotel. Once at the hotel, as Gibbons waited outside, Skaggs went in and then gunshots rang out. Roman was shot at least seven times. As for the defense, they didn't do opening statements, but could be claiming self-defense. A journal entry by Skaggs that was found after his arrest says, quote, I shot Tito Roman because he said he was going to shoot me. As for Haley Gibbons, she was also charged with murder, but she has taken a plea deal and is expected to testify at some point during this trial this week. She could be sentenced as early as next week when the trial is over. Skaggs, if found guilty, is facing up to life in prison. Erica Hernandez, KSAT 12 News. Four days after five people were killed in Cleveland, Texas, the main suspect and two others are in custody. Francisco Oropesa is currently being held on a $5 million bond for five counts of murder. He was arrested last night after investigators found him hiding under a pile of laundry at a home near the crime scene. Oropesa is accused of going to his neighbor's home and killing four adults and a nine-year-old boy on Friday after they asked him to stop shooting his rifle near their house. I want to be able to look that family in the eyes and say that justice was done at the end of this. Also facing charges, a woman who authorities say shares a child with Oropesa and helped him hide from law enforcement. And a person believed to have helped Oropesa escape that crime scene. A hearing is set for tomorrow to decide whether Oropesa's charges will be upgraded to capital murder. Right now, 1,500 troops are getting ready to deploy to the southern border. The Biden administration sending those troops ahead of the end of Title 42 next week. The policy allowed the U.S. to reject migrants based on COVID-19 concerns, even those seeking asylum in the United States. Officials are now expecting a surge of migrants at the border. The Department of Homeland Security says smugglers are already spreading false information that the border is open. We do expect that encounters at our southern border will increase as smugglers are seeking to take advantage of this change. Overnight, White House officials reached an agreement with Mexico. Mexican officials confirming they will continue to accept migrants expelled by the U.S. from at least four different countries. Mental health first aid. It's a training course that teaches how to jump in and care for people during a crisis until professional help arrives. It, the problem is, though, that that free training is not available to everyone. Courtney Friedman explains how local advocates are trying to change that. 13 years ago, resources were not what they are today. It was 13 years ago that Greg Watson lost his dad to suicide and slipped down that path himself. He said San Antonio's chapter of the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention helped save him. So he's now a board member fighting to create even more resources, like one called Mental Health First Aid. That teaches people how to identify an individual that is struggling with mental health issues and support them at that peer level. It's a little like CPR in the way that anyone can get certified to do that ground level first aid work before the mental health professionals get there. The thing is right now, it's not free for everyone. Because it's an independently owned and developed curriculum, there's a cost involved in that because they need to be able to provide further research. Right now, it's only free for people like educators and health professionals. That's why Watson and 34 other local advocates met with 60 legislators in Austin last month to push for grant funding that would make the training free for everyone. These grants already exist to help kind of alleviate the cost of that, to get people trained to support at that peer level. Can we please just expand who falls under the eligibility list? He says the legislators were very receptive and he's hopeful more people will soon be able to help those in mental health crisis. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. May is Mental Health Awareness Month and the AFSP has a campaign called Talk Away the Dark. 
It includes a lot of programs that you can utilize. Head to their website for all that information. If you're struggling with mental health or suicidal thoughts, you can call 988 988 or text talk to 741741. Take a live look outside right now, 82 degrees out there. And my question is about humidity and storms. The chances for storms are rising and the humidity is going to be rising. Ah, well. there you go. You saw those nice high thin clouds in that live cam and these are the high cirrus clouds coming in from the west and southwest and they should give us a very picturesque sunset. However, we are also seeing the blow off clouds from these storms in Mexico and those blow off clouds are moving eastward and may uh, unfortunately shroud out that good sunset for some folks, especially west of 281. Either way, we've got this nice flow from the southwest, and when we get that, we often get those higher clouds and beautiful sunset. So go outside between 8 and 830. That's our best viewing this evening. Temperatures in the upper 70s. Have your camera ready and snap those photos. Share them on KSAC Connect via the Weather Authority app. High thin clouds this evening. Temperatures falling to the 70s. Quiet out there tonight. We're going to talk about our rising storm chances for tomorrow and beyond in just a bit. Thank you, Adam. Let's check out Loop 410 and Jackson Keller right now. And you can see traffic moving smoothly in both directions. And the good news at this hour, we don't have any major traffic tie ups to tell you about. With more rain that could be headed our way, that means there's a chance of more mosquitoes around. Coming up after the break, find out why some people attract mosquitoes more than others. Next. I want to give you a quick look at what we're working on for you on the night beat. Fiesta memories turn into a fight for his life. Tonight we hear from the man who was shot in the middle of Fiesta celebrations. What he says is motivating him to make a full recovery. And writers in the entertainment industry put their pens down and signs up as we're two days into the WGA strike. We're going to speak with a lecturer at UTSA who explains how this is also affecting production in San Antonio. Those stories and more on the night beat at 10. All right, rain headed our way for the next few days. That can mean more flowers, more green grass, and yes, more mosquitoes. Did you know the bugs actually track people down by locating our carbon dioxide that we exhale, our body heat, and our body odor? Ursula Perry with why some of us will be mosquito magnets while others are bite free and no, it's got nothing to do with your blood type. Mosquitoes, one of the few insects to evolve a taste for human blood. An incredibly protein-rich meal, turns out. When they bite, it's uncomfortable because it, there's an irritation associated with the biting of the mosquito. It's actually injecting saliva into your body. Each year, mosquitoes infect about 400 million humans with the dengue virus, but that's not all. While they're tasting your blood, they can also potentially transmit viruses like yellow fever, Zika virus, and chikungunya. Certain people are more attractive to mosquitoes than others. It's because they have higher levels of something called carboxylic acid on their skin. That's the acid that is produced through sebum, the oily layer that coats your skin. Professor Michael Rowe and his colleagues are working on a mosquito repellent cloth to prevent even these people from getting infected by these pesky insects. We have a, 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 an amazing scientist in our team that's a mathematician. He can ma mathematically define all those parameters, combining them to describe what a cloth would have to be like to prevent mosquitoes from biting. So why am I a mosquito magnet while my sweet husband never gets bitten? He says it's because he is sweeter than me. Nevertheless, it is an itching burning question that researchers are trying to solve. What makes some people more attractive to mosquitoes than others? They're hoping to develop a topical cream that will one day make us unattractive to these bugs. Meantime, yes. Keep on using that spray. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. 
Some of the rains we've had lately, they've been heavy where they've left things in the backyard full oh, of yeah. water. Yep. Got to go, you know, dump it all out. Make sure you get the nooks and the grannies. Yeah. How about the rain that's coming this way? Even more so, Adam. Yeah, we'll have more of that. And daily rain chances basically on the way. So they start tomorrow. Storm, storm chances are back in the picture tomorrow around this time, especially west of town. And then daily afternoon and evening storm chances in the forecast all the way through next week and warm and humid this weekend. We're going to rise the temperature a little bit. We'll raise that up and then also increase the humidity. Take a look at the radar. Just like yesterday, some activity in Mexico across the Rio Grande. It's highly unlikely to make it near Del Rio, Eagle Pass or any communities along the border. However, I do think it's going to be a different picture tomorrow. You look at our storm chances. We boosted them to 40% tomorrow and then 30% daily Friday this weekend and even into next week as well. This is that isolated activity that's likely to pop up in the afternoon and evening with a similar trend to what we'll see tomorrow. So let's talk about the trend. Yesterday and today, all out in West Texas and even parts of Mexico, even stretching up into New Mexico as well. I do think that activity will make it eastward tomorrow, but here's partial part of what's driving it. This big upper level swirl over California and then this upper level energy that's moving in because of the counterclockwise swirl there over California that sets us up for the southwesterly flow aloft, which is that dirty flow we talk about because it's just messy. It just has these little impulses of energy that go poof, poof, come, come and go and they're hard to time out. But when they coincide and overlap with our peak heating during the day in our peak instability, it could be enough to break the cap and get some showers and storms going. And that's what we're expecting. This will be the trend that I was talking about. Development first initiation likely west of San Antonio, either in Mexico, in the mountains there or somewhere along the Rio Grande and then development eastward. Those will drift eastward through the late afternoon and into the evening hours. I don't think what this model is showing here is exactly where the storms will be tomorrow, but I do like the trend that it shows because I think that's going to happen where the initiation will be out west and then the activity will be drifting eastward into south central Texas, potentially even San Antonio later on in the evening with the chance of severe storms. Anything that develops this time of year could very easily become strong to severe. We're in that scattered category for the risk of severe storms tomorrow on a scale of zero to five. That's a two in terms of the severe storm risk. And that actually stretches all the way up to the North Texas, up the plains into Oklahoma and Southern Kansas as well. So looking at it just throughout the day tomorrow, we could see a few hit or miss sprinkles or light showers noon to 5 p.m. And then 5 p.m. We're looking at that development out west from 7 to 11 p.m. We've got that 40% chance closer to San Antonio. What we're hoping is that activity weakens as it approaches us. It's just not necessarily always the case. 82 degrees right now, dew point of 56. So the dew point's lower. It's not bad now. That happens this time of year. We get the drier air aloft. It mixes down during the hottest part of the day, gives us a bit of a break. Not complaining. I do think that'll be changing though in the days ahead. Tomorrow we start the day at 67. Pleasanton, Poteet 69, Kerrville, Bandera 64. And then by the noon hour, we're at 76 degrees. We'll see some of the low morning clouds break up a bit. So some peaks of sunshine, 83 degrees, the high temperature. And notice those storm chances rising up closer to 40%, 7 p.m. to 10 p.m. around San Antonio. 80s tomorrow, but get ready for 90 degrees to return this upcoming weekend with high humidity. So a sticky 90 degrees on the way. Oh, sounds lovely. Thanks, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> sticky, lovely. Yeah. All right. So the question is, I haven't been paying attention to the NBA playoffs a lot since the Spurs are not part of it, but right. this game did get my attention. Lakers. Yeah, Lakers-Warriors, I think, is going to be a fantastic, very entertaining series. Last night was game one. The L.A. Lakers won, and they say it's basically because they've been in playoff mode for several weeks, and UTSA men's tennis team is getting ready for the NCAA D1 championships. Coming up. No, I, mean, I hope that bat keeps doing it, so we're going to keep swinging it. That's the Rangers' Josh Young response when asked if he was going to save the bat he used to hit his first ever Grand Slam in big board sports.
The L.A. Lakers held off a late flurry by the Golden State Warriors to win game one of the Western Conference semifinals, 117 to 112 last night. The Lakers led by 14 with six minutes left in the game, only to watch the Dubs tied at 112 with less than two minutes to go. But the Lakers scored the last five points, taking away home court advantage from the defending champs. The Lakers, who won a playing game to earn the seventh seed, already feel battle tested. We've been playing playoff basketball uh, for about two and a half months now, just trying to, you know, punch our clock in to be able to play right now in the postseason. So, um, you know, we've been very resilient tonight versus, um, uh, versus a team like Golden State, um, you know, defending champions, and we know how great they are on their home floor over the years. So um, to withstand that and, um, you know, it's, it's, it's another uh, good step for our, for, our, for our ball club. Game two is tomorrow night at 8 in San Francisco. Texas Rangers third baseman Josh Young was selected as the American League Rookie of the Month for April. It's the 10th time a Rangers player has won the AL's Monthly Rookie Award since it was first introduced in 2001, and he's the first Texas infielder to take the honors. He batted 270 in April with six home runs, five doubles, and 21 runs batted in over 26 games through the end of the month. He finished off the month strongly with a career-high tying five RBI versus the Yankees that also featured his first career grand slam at any level. How about these two youngsters? It's pretty fun. Mason Miller, Bryce Miller. Mason Miller, three strikeouts in five innings. Bryce Miller, eight strikeouts in five innings. It was Miller time at the Oakland Coliseum last night. The A's Mason Miller and the Mariners Bryce Miller, who were born one day apart in August of 1998, put on a show last night. Mason left after seven, in seven innings of no-hit baseball, while Bryce from New Braunfels High School had a perfect game in the bottom of the sixth when Tony Kemp singled the center to break it up. Bryce went six innings, allowing two hits, one run, no walks, and ten strikeouts. He retired the first 16 batters in his MLB debut, and the Mariners win the game 2-1. to one. We stopped by UTSA this afternoon to chat with the men's tennis team as they prepare for the NCAA D1 Men's Tennis Championships. The open play Saturday versus Pepperdine. The team did not have a full practice today, opting to rest the players ahead of the tournament. The Roadrunners are 18-6 and six and making the program's first at-large appearance. This is awesome. Uh, this is my third year with the program. And to see the success for all the hard work we've put in. I sweat over the last two years, it's finally paying off. It's super excited. Uh, we work really hard to be in this position, all of the team. So we are very happy to, to make it. Number 41 UTSA will face number 37 Pepperdine Saturday at Austin's Tennis Center at 10 in the morning. We wish the Roadrunners the very best. You know, I don't really have a lot of tennis knowledge, Larry, like but. my co-anchor here. Uh -huh, so, know. you know. He is keeping my tennis days alive. He is. I'm here for it. Yep. Love it. I'm all about the backhanded compliments. Jeez. We'll okay. be right back. I'm not about that. We got to go. <laughs> Time is ticking for lawmakers to get the job done in Austin as the current legislative session is winding down toward the end of this month. We have Scott Braddock joining us today for our KSAT Q&A, editor of the Quorum Report. Scott, always good to see you. A uh, big issue we want to start talking about here. First mm -hmm. off, property taxes. We knew this was yeah. one of the governor's priorities going into this session. Where are lawmakers on that topic? You know, Myra, I have heard from some very conservative Republicans in just the last 15 minutes uh, who were talking about this. They said that it would be nice if the governor was acting right now like property taxes was one of his big issues. Instead, he's out on the campaign trail for school vouchers. And this is the way one Republican put it to me. They said it would be cool if he would act like he was the governor right now, get back to the Capitol and tell the House and Senate what he would like them to do uh, about property taxes. As you know, we've talked about here, the lieutenant governor wants to do one thing, which is increasing the homestead exemption. That's his that's the central piece of his plan. And then the Speaker of the House wants to go with lowering appraisal caps to 5%. I was told within the last 48 hours that some of the Republican senators who serve under Patrick in the Texas Senate have started to talk amongst themselves about the need to negotiate with the House because we are running out of time in this legislative session. I'll tell you that the uh, the most popular thing at quorumreport.com right now is right on the homepage. We have the countdown for exactly how long it is until the session is over. It's always the most popular thing right now at this part of the session. Not that we're keeping count, but we are. 26 days, 5 hours, 26 minutes, and 43 seconds. As I'm talking to you to the, for them to you know get all this worked out 
Um, and there's a reason that there are three big leaders in the state, reason that there are an odd number of leaders. When two of them don't agree, the other one has to step in and sort of referee, and the governor's not doing that. What do you do you get a feel for whether that's going to happen? Because we, when you talk about just the end of the session, there's also deadlines coming up for when things need to be at certain points in the process. Correct. Yeah. So the things that we're talking about, these big priorities, they've already cleared those hurdles. So, so for example, okay. for the property tax bills, the House and Senate have both passed versions of that uh, coming up next week. There are a- absolutely hard deadlines for when bills have to have reached certain uh, thresholds to be able to have any chance of becoming Texas law. In fact, one of the really hard deadlines on that is coming up uh, next Thursday. Uh, And so that's one of those uh, nights. It's one of the uh, more dramatic evenings in the Texas House of Representatives uh, because it's a calendar date by which certain things have to pass. The House will work all the way until midnight trying to pass as many bills as possible. And actually, this week, they are working a six-day work week, which they haven't done all sessions so far. Sometimes during sessions, they'll do a couple of weeks like that. I think this time around, this will this will be the only week that they do it. So they're going to work all the way to Saturday trying to pass as many things as possible. And some of that is under pressure from Lieutenant Governor Patrick, uh, who had uh, called out the Texas House last week in a tweet where he said that you know they weren't producing enough bills. They're not getting enough work done. And then, of course, uh, after he said that, then the House had to adjourn early anyway and leave some of their work for Monday because of a bad storm that moved through central Texas. It seems to be a habit of the lieutenant governor criticizing what's happening on the House side of things. Yes, but, that's right. Uh, so you talked about you talked about the governor talking about school mm-hmm. choice and vouchers. Is that one of the things that needs to be figured out before this deadline coming next Thursday or would they pass that? Does it, and do you think it looks like any actions are going to be taken on school choice and vouchers? Well, great question, because the House has not taken action on school vouchers other than to, during the budget debate, ban tax dollars from going to school vouchers. Uh, It was nearly supermajority opposition still to school vouchers in this state with rural Republicans uh, and Democrats joining together to really deliver a defeat for the governor on that. In fact, there are some observers of the process who say that it's uh, maybe pointless for the governor to still be talking about this during the regular session, as I alluded to earlier, because it doesn't look like they can get there unless there's legislative overtime. And I'll tell you, that vote against vouchers earlier in the session, it was so decisive. Again, you had um, you know almost 100 votes uh, that would have been against school vouchers if you're looking at that amendment as a test vote for it. Um, I'm not sure how the governor could get there this year. I think it would be a better use of his time to be back at the Capitol trying to convince these folks what they ought to do on some of his other priorities, like taxes in particular. We're coming up on the one year anniversary of the shooting at Robb Elementary in Uvalde. We know yeah. that law or uh, bills have been proposed to make changes in the wake mm-hmm. of that. Families of the victims have been pushing for change day in and day out since that happened. Any movement on any of the proposals in the aftermath of that shooting? The only proposals that are moving forward have to do with increased school security, including uh, providing funding for uh, arming teachers and some other things like that. Uh, More guns, it seems to be the answer from the Republican leadership. Uh, The things that the families have been pushing for, in particular, uh, the legislation that would raise the age for the legal purchase of uh, certain firearms, that's not going anywhere. Um, And I've been saying this every chance I get, the two things can be true uh, at the same time. One, if these families have been absolutely jerked around here at the Texas Capitol uh, by the legislative process, you know uh, that when they came to testify uh, in favor of that legislation to raise the age, uh, that some of them had to wait as long as 13 hours at the Capitol before they got to give their testimony to lawmakers. One mother uh, uh, who lost her daughter in Uvalde said, what did you think that we would go home? You know, we didn't go home when we were waiting for our, our kids to be uh, confirmed dead. So it was very moving to listen to those families. Uh, so yes, it's a farce. It's not happening. That's the first true thing. The second true thing is that their voices do matter. And I do know a lot of folks here at the Capitol, including a lot of Republicans, who are glad that those folks were here to tell their stories. And I'll give the Speaker of the House some credit on this. He did say that even though he didn't believe there were the votes in the House to pass anything like what the Uvalde families want, he still wanted to have those hard conversations. He said that uh, as the legislative session was opening. And that has happened. Um, But as far as the legislation itself, it's not going anywhere. Won't even be debated on the floor of the House or the Senate, correct? No, that's absolutely right. All right. I I want to talk to something that's sort of legislative, legislature related. And that's Roland Gutierrez has long been rumored Mm -hmm. as he was going to take on U.S. Senator Ted Cruz uh, coming up here. Now, Colin Allred, a House representative from the Houston area, has said he is going to run. 
Does that mm -hmm. change Gutierrez's mind, or do you think Roland Gutierrez is going to run against Ted Cruz? No, I'm not making fun of you, Steve. Colin Allred is from Dallas. Sorry, from the and Dallas I'm, area. Well, Sorry. here's the thing. I'm point. I'm, well, here's the thing. I'm pointing that out because nobody knows who the Congress members are from other cities, right? I mean, if, if you're in Houston, you don't know who Colin. You don't know who Colin Allred is if you're in Houston or San Antonio. I, I know like who Roland Gutierrez who, is, though. In, that's for sure. Right. Well, in Dallas, they wouldn't know who uh, you know uh, Joaquin Castro is, right? Or they wouldn't have as much of an idea. So, so look, I think it's interesting that you have somebody who is a member of Congress who's taken a look at a U.S. Senate run, has announced uh, that as you know uh, as recently as. Uh, the last couple of days. Uh, but as you said, uh, Gutierrez has been, uh, you know, in the news uh, for the Uvalde uh, coverage for a year. He's the senator who represents that area. He's from San Antonio, um, but he, his district includes Uvalde, and he's been standing up for those families. And he's been on national broadcasts, you know, for the last year talking about that. So in some ways, I think he in Texas might have better name ID than Congressman Allred. Here's the real problem for either one of them. I can't see how it's possible that Allred or Gutierrez ends up getting much national money for a race uh, for the U.S. Senate um, in this next cycle, uh, because at this point, it looks like the Democrats are going to need their national money in other states to try to either uh, win other U.S. Senate seats uh, or keep some of the ones that they have. So it's really going to be a question of resources. I, I will say this, um, if Allred and Gutierrez get into it in a primary, I'll have a lot of fun covering that. <laughs> There's a countdown on the quorum report for when the session's going to end. Our producer's mm -hmm. giving us one for this very segment. But before <laughs> we go, if somebody's watching a piece of legislation to see whether lawmakers take action on it, mm -hmm. when is the drop dead date to decide whether it goes forward or nothing's going to happen? The drop dead date, there's a couple of them. Uh, the eighth, which is coming up real quick, is uh, when bills need to come out of a committee in the House. Uh, and if they don't, there's almost no chance they're going to be uh, a law in this state. And then the next deadline after that would be next Thursday. That's the deadline I was talking about where the House is going to work all the way to midnight to try to pass as many bills as they can off the floor. If a bill doesn't make it by then, there's almost no chance that it can pass. But I will say this. There is an amendment process where certain things can be tagged onto other bills as vehicles. So nothing's really dead till Sonny dies. So keep watching that countdown. Scott Braddock, he's the editor with the Quorum Report. You can find him at quorumreport.com. Scott, always appreciate your time. Thank you. I'll talk soon. We'll be right back.